Founded in 1857, the Moravian Historical Society preserves, interprets, and celebrates the rich culture of the Moravians. Our museum collection includes objects, musical instruments, books, paintings, and other materials that focus on Moravian history, music, and people. These objects are brought to life through ongoing study and examination, and this research project in particular has brought to life our 18th century piano thought to have been here in the Whitfield House since it was built. Lori Libin presented the project to me in September of 2019. Lori, the retired curator of musical instruments at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and longtime friend of the Moravian Historical Society, asked that we allow a small team of researchers to examine the piano in our collection, with one of the goals to create a playable replica. That replica would then be donated to the Moravian Historical Society where along with the 1776 Tannenberg organ, it would allow us to better interpret the music of the 18th century Moravian community here in Pennsylvania. I was intrigued. I also understood the, the potential to add to our knowledge of Moravian material culture. So just a few months after that initial meeting, we welcomed John Watson, Thomas Winter, and Michelle Winter to the Whitfield House. John is an independent conservator and maker of early keyboard instruments. He retired in 2016 from the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, where he served for 28 years as conservator and curator of musical instruments. Tom Winter builds, conserves, and restores early keyboard instruments at his workshop in San Francisco. Michelle Winter partners with John and Tom to publish and administer ClinkScale online, the largest research database about surviving historic pianos. So even though their credentials were impeccable, I'll admit I had a bit of a panic that first day when I came up to the museum to find the instrument disassembled and spread across the museum. Did they know how to put it back together? Did we discuss that detail? So my fear was quickly replaced with curiosity. As they got inside the instrument, it became clear that this humble instrument had an incredible story to tell. Believed to be the oldest extant piano made in America, this instrument demonstrates how incredibly important music was to the early Moravians. Think about it, when this instrument was built, Nazareth was at the frontier of the Pennsylvania wilderness. I find it incredible that while Nazareth and Bethlehem were just being established, the Moravians were building remarkably sophisticated musical instruments. So after their on-site research was complete, John went to a studio in Virginia and Tom and Michelle returned to San Francisco to begin work on creating the reproduction. Nearly a year later, the instrument was completed. Last fall, I had the opportunity to travel to Williamsburg to see the finished instrument and to hear its debut concert in the Art Museum at the Colonial Williamsburg. What follows is my conversation during that visit with John about how this oldest American-made piano found its voice. I first uh, learned of the upright piano in, uh, at, in Nazareth at the Moravian Historical Society. In 1991, I attended the American Musical Instrument Society meeting there, and a presentation was done by uh, uh, Lawrence Libin, who has been a friend for many, many years. And I remember it quite vividly. Uh, it was a fascinating instrument. Uh, we were all crowded into the uh, upstairs room in the Historical Society, and uh, uh, Lawrence uh, gave this talk about this instrument with it just a, a, a few feet away. And um, it, was, uh, it was a fascinating instrument on every level because of its significance in American musical history, uh, thought to be the oldest surviving piano made in America. Um, and I recall one of the specific questions that one of the people at the conference asked uh, Laurie at the end of his presentation. He said, can't you just play a couple notes? People were dying to hear what it sounded like. And I remember I was uh, sort of in the early stages of my career as a curator at that time. 
And I actually uh, learned something from Lori in his answer. Um, and I've learned a lot from Lori over the years. But he said, no, I don't want to play a note because it's not restored. It won't sound like its maker envisioned. It would be unfair to the instrument, to the maker, and to you uh, getting the wrong impression of what it sounded like. So, uh, so he declined. But we've wondered, of course, uh, very much over the years, what did it sound like? And uh, the present project has been toward answering that question, among many others. We could restore the original instrument. In fact, it's very well cared for, and it wouldn't take that much work. But one of the things I learned early on in my career as a historian is that these objects from the past are the primary documents. Uh, they contain more detailed information about how they were made and even what the maker was thinking. Uh, and the problem with restoration is that although it satisfies our curiosity what an instrument sounded like, um, it can't be done without some degree of interpretation of what's missing or what's been changed over time, and we have to use our imagination in, in, in restoring it to what we think it was originally like. But that's still an interpretation, and no two restorers are going to quite agree on what, what the goal is, what the particular sound might have been. And every time we do uh, restoration, it moves the object a step further away from that authoritative coming right from the hand of the original maker. What the Moravian Historical Society has done, which is brilliant, they've left the instrument, the original instrument, unrestored, unchanged. And our job in making the reproduction was made very much easier that there's rather little evidence of past changes. And we felt that we had a full set of instructions how to make it. Um, and uh, we were able to do so and end up with a playing reproduction that's very like the original. And the original instrument is untouched. It's amazing what you could learn from looking at the handiwork of a historical maker even hundreds of years ago. We can look at tool marks and actually figure out what his tool chest had in it. We can figure out what he did first and what he did second and what he did third. We can figure out, and this is the fascinating part, we can figure out what he was thinking because some things he or she, I suppose, was very, very careful, slowed way down and worked in a very precise way. That was something the maker thought was very, very important. Other things seem almost slapdash. Those things they thought were unimportant. And that's part of the, part of the story we're trying to uncover. I've often thought that the difference between a novice and a master is not necessarily knowing the process, how to cut a dovetail, how to, you know, make a mortise and tenon joint. The real difference is that a master knows what's important and what's not. And the novice will sometime lavish a great deal of time on things that are unimportant, and then not quite enough on the things that are really important. So that's what we're able to see in looking at the actual workmanship of the original maker. There are other times when a particular detail of construction really makes us scratch our head. What on earth were they thinking? 
For instance, I remember on this instrument in particular, we discovered on the inside, in a place that no one can see unless you're taking the instrument apart, beautifully cut F holes, like in a violin or a, a viola, cello. F holes in the belly rail between the, the cavity where the mechanical action is and, and inside the sound box, covered up by the soundboard. What was he thinking? Why did he go to the trouble of making those rather detailed F-hole cut cutouts? It was usual to have a cutout in, in that portion, in the, in the so-called belly rail of an instrument like this. But why go to that trouble? And we wondered if maybe we were seeing something about his relationship to God, who he was aware was watching. Maybe he was playing to that audience. And he didn't care whether other people in our generation would see such a thing. It's fascinating what you can, uh, what you can begin to see when you see enough of a person's workmanship. For a historian like me, what I really want to know is who made this and why? What was the culture that they were living in? What were they trying to accomplish? And the first assumption one has of a keyboard instrument uh, in with a long history in America, made apparently in the mid, maybe even early 18th century, uh, where was it made? The first assumption is it was made in Europe and brought over by these uh, immigrant groups. So it was a question that was a burning question decades ago. And uh, a colleague uh, of mine, a scholar named John Coster, uh, came in and examined the wood uh, types in the instrument and was able to identify at least two of the woods as being North American woods. Uh, not woods that are typically imported into Germany uh, or, or Europe. So he was able to determine that it had an American history. So that raised all kinds of very tantalizing questions. If, uh, if not a German maker working in Germany, then who? That's so early. The American uh, piano industry wouldn't start for another um, 75 years. And the very first pianos to be made in the English-speaking world uh, came in the, in the 1760s. Yet this is coming before that, and not in Europe, not in England, not in London, but in Pennsylvania. So these are compelling questions. And uh, so at the top of my mind, in studying all the evidence of this person, I could see all kinds of evidence that he knew what he was doing. This is a one-off instrument as far as we know. There are no other similar instruments, although there could have been that have not survived. This instrument in Nazareth was something different because there were many ways he could have messed up miscalculations. And you can see if something is so miscalculated that it, it can't work, then you redo and redo and reshape and shave here and there. And, it, and then you, at some point, you abandon it and say, okay, well, this is, this is what we're going to have to settle with. It wasn't like that. It was like this guy, he worked out every detail of the geometry, of the balancing, of the mechanical motions. And it was as if he got it right first time. So this was an experienced instrument maker. Okay, that narrows it down. Uh, how many, who were the experienced instrument makers in the mid 18th century in Pennsylvania? The list is quite short. And most of the names on that list are people that, well, they came a little later or they only made very few instruments. Maybe they're one or two organs that survive. But uh, I didn't find anyone that really convinced me they could have been experienced enough except one. And that's uh, Johannes Clem. 
anglicized his name to John Clem, who is credited as being America's first professional organ builder. And let's be clear, uh, in that period, organ builders made stringed keyboard instruments as well, harpsichords and clavichords, invariably. Today, people tend to specialize more. But John Clem made a harpsichord before he immigrated to America for none other than Count von Zinzendorf. Uh, and he made clavichords and organs. He came to America in the uh, 1730, uh, 1730s, 1733, and, um, and settled in Bethlehem and and various places, New York, uh, but, but later in life in uh, Bethlehem and Nazareth. Uh, lived actually in the Whitefield House in Nazareth. And uh, he was, uh, he's a celebrity in a way of all those names. One other person, his student was uh, uh, David Tannenberg, who, uh, who actually conceivably could have made it if it was in the la later part of the period we imagine, but he was a fledgling maker himself at that time. John Clem is my, is my bet of the person who made this instrument. And that's an extraordinary claim. The only surviving instrument by John Clem is a spinet that's in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And it gives precious little evidence of his actual working style because it's been through a lot of changes. It was modified uh, into a display case, I think. And I've examined um, dozens of photographs, close-up photographs of its work. So we don't have much to go on, uh, mostly anecdotal information about his career, but he had the experience. And he would have seen instruments similar to this in Germany before he came. So that's my bet that it was John Clem. I'm, uh, I'm willing to attribute. We say attribute when we're not 100% sure, uh, but, but I think it's possible. So here we are uh, this weekend. The instrument was just finished a couple of days ago, and uh, it's sitting in the auditorium. This is, this is a debut of a new instrument, and it's the culmination of years of research and uh, finally construction in the workshop, more research, research through the making. We call it uh, experimental archaeology where you learn about the past by doing it. And, uh, and it's been a, a fantastic research project. Uh, in a way, this is a culmination to hear what it has to say musically to us from the stage.
what I'd like to do at this point is invite uh, John and Tom and Michelle to um, unmute and <laughs> would like to say a few words. Um, I invite you to do that now. Hello, we're here. Hey. <laughs> Hello, um, and uh, thanks a lot uh, for making this, uh, this video and uh, give us an opportunity to talk about uh, what has been truly uh, one of our favorite, uh, favorite projects over the years, a great one. I think Grace captured the, the process and the spirit beautifully in her video. So please pass along now, thanks to her. Yes. I will, thanks. So um, I, I'll start with a question. Uh, John, you talked about um, understanding the maker a bit and um, through, through the process and what was what the maker maybe spent more time on and what they spent less time on. And, and you used the Apple as an example is there another thing that surprised you or that, that you discovered? Um, and I'll open this up to, to either, to all three of you really. Uh, one thing that uh, I, it was actually not my observation, but uh, when I uh, invited some of my um, keyboard performer friends to try out the instrument, um, the comment was made that uh, the instrument is surprisingly capable of fast repetition. So the, the action, the mechanical action, that, uh, which is the portion that Tom built, uh, is so conceived and perhaps also because of Tom's workmanship, uh, works very well. And is not, uh, it's not crude. Uh, a crude action would uh, very likely be too slow to play a trill or you know fast notes, but this instrument seems to be up to the task. Yeah, I would add to that that I mean the first thing that I did when we got back to San Francisco was to build a model of the action um, just to make sure that it would work before I actually built the whole thing, and I was very pleasantly surprised. Um, it seems so simple in its concepts and its construction, but once I had it together, uh, it proved to be remarkably responsive and yet durable. I mean, you could play it as hard as you want and it never malfunctioned. It, it is a remarkable piece of workmanship uh, and a remarkable piece of design there. Um, clearly, whoever built this, uh, probably John Clem, um, really knew what he was doing. And I have to say, I'm, I'm a retired school orchestra teacher. I'm not a piano builder or anything. So I was expecting, well, I was expecting one that this instrument would be very easy for the men to build because Laurie Libin had said to us when we visited with the American Musical Instrument Society, he said, oh, it has a very simple action. So <laughs> yeah, simple, but not at all like a piano. Yeah. In fact, you, you all think, you think, okay, a piano has hammers that hit the string. This has little things that are more like popsicle sticks that come forward and bump up against the strings. So there was nothing piano-like about it when we opened it up. Uh, that was my big surprise. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would add, you know, I mean, I think John would agree when we first opened up the instrument, um, our assumption was that it would be a crudely made instrument by an amateur uh, who maybe didn't really understand what they were doing. And it immediately became apparent that this, this builder um, was well-trained, probably in organ technology and knew, I mean, he, he was working from years of experience. This was not a random chance. Uh, it was a, a beautifully conceived, designed and constructed instrument. Uh, it, was, it was an astonishing surprise for, I think for all of us. I remember being surprised by that also, um, you know, and I remember remarking that its outward appearance, it, I use the word humble, um, it, 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 is, it, it is humble, it's simple, but, but I remember when you, when you got inside, you realized it was quite sophisticated, yeah. yeah. So a question here from Barbara Dietrich, who um, she asks, are, are upright pianos made at all today? Did the upright construction make it portable at all? Well, the, the upright uh, 
piano that's familiar today, of course, um, has as one of its principal features that the strings, uh, vertical strings, go all the way down to the floor. Uh -oh. All the way down to the floor, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and actually, if we're going to talk about port, John is frozen up, so we'll jump in here. Um, uh, I mean, certainly upright pianos today are not entirely portable um, because there's a cast iron plate in there. There's a lot of wood and they are, they are heavy. Yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, I've been, I've been working on pianos for 50 years. Like I work on them. I will not move them. That, we could move this one. But this one was yeah. easy. We just picked that up and carried it across the room with, without even thinking about it. Yeah. Well, we thought about it a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> um, so Lawrence Libin says, congratulations um, and thanks. What com compromises were necessary in making the replica? In retrospect, what might you have done differently might you make a second copy? Oh, oh well, there's a question. Um, I, I, if from my point of view, building the action, I did not feel the need to compromise uh, anywhere. It was, it, it, it was a, what I would call, I hesitate to use the word a simple design um, because there was a certain element of sophistication, but uh, it's, not, it's not complicated in that there are a lot of parts or that the parts are difficult to manufacture. So from that point of view, it was actually pretty easy on my end to reproduce what was there. Uh, I would say there might've been one or two elements that were not entirely visible to us and we did not wish to disassemble uh, the instrument any further. I mean, we did draw the line at um, not breaking glue joints to, uh, to get in to, um, to really examine it. So there, there were a, in a couple of cases where I had to like reverse engineer what was going on and make my best guess as to what it was that I, you know, that I was only seeing a little bit, not in its entirety. Um, but I would say, certainly from my point of view, and I'm going to say from John's point of view too, because I was, even though I wasn't there, I was part and parcel. I, we've had Zoom meetings, we shared photos, and I saw a lot of what he was doing. I'm going to say that he, I don't think he had to make any serious compromises either. Um, I don't know if the people understand that Tom built the action in San Francisco and then we took it to FedEx office and they shipped it to Williamsburg and John put it into the instrument and then strung it and yeah. made it play. So yeah. it, that's, that's the, the yeah. sequence of events. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Michelle, for mentioning that. That, that is an important um, uh, to, to note that, that you were working on different sides of the country, San Francisco and Virginia and um, I know that there was a, a, you were holding your breath, I'm sure, um, that day when, when the package arrived in Virginia and, and we had to see if it would fit. Um, so yeah. obviously uh, it did. I mean, the original plan was for me to be there. Right. And to spend two or three weeks there helping with that final assembly and the final construction. Um, that, that didn't happen. Uh, in place of it, I actually, along with a box of parts, um, I sent John about a 20 page Word document, uh, including photos with detailed instructions on what order to, you know, to install and fit the parts and to make the assembly. And then we still had, you know, phone calls and conversations as we worked our way through it. And I mean, the good news is most of it, most of it went pretty well. There were a couple little surprises, but they are easily corrected on John's end. Yeah, so. yeah, I'd say it went pretty well too. So another a question here from Riddick Weber. Um, he asks, what did you learn about the past other than what we can attribute this, that we can contribute, attribute this to Clem, sorry. Um, so. John's back. Yeah, you know, that's actually, John is back and that's actually a really good question for him. Um, did you catch that, John? No. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll read it again. 
Um, Riddick Weber asks, what did you learn about the past other than that we can attribute this to Clem? Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> How many pages was that report that I uh, yeah. turned in? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, oh gosh. Yeah, uh, um, I, yeah, obviously I don't know where to start, but, but um, it's sort of like um, living with the people for a while or, or getting into the mind of a particular uh, instrument maker. But there are so many details, um, uh, things that he chose to do that, um, that gave glimpses of the, of the person, really. Um, there was the main structural uh, strut on the inside that, that no one ever sees is curved. It's it's sort of we we call it the serpentine strut, and um, you know, I, I just seeing the kind of work that uh, that they did um, and the choices that they made was it. Obviously, it's it's difficult to put in words, but it's you you feel like you get to know the the person or the way he thinks. Um, I don't know what else to say, Tom. Do you do you have anything? Yeah, actually, um, you know, once we came back, once we came back to San Francisco, uh, after having examined the instrument, I I spent a fair amount of time, fair amount of time, a uh, few days anyway, really looking through the literature and. Um, looking into instruments of a similar nature that were built at about that period. Uh, and there are a few out there. And having seen that instrument and then having built the action, uh, it gave me a, a much deeper understanding of what was going on in those guys' heads when they were building those, what, what really were essentially um, very early instruments, and it was still very much an experimental stage. Everyone was a little bit different as they were trying out new ideas or trying, trying different ideas to get around some of the problems that they were encountering. Uh, and it, it gave me a much deeper understanding of those instruments. Um, that I, I don't think I, you'll never get that kind of an understanding from looking at books or drawings um, or even quite frankly, even like just going to a museum and looking at the instrument, you can see something on the surface, but when you take it apart and then you try to build a copy of it, boy, you know, it's like you really kind of slip into the, in, into the, into the builder's mind and you see how he was perceiving the whole process and what it was that he was trying to build. It was an eye-opening experience to say the least. And the follow-up question from Riddick um, is, is to me, actually, he asks, how does the Moravian Historical Society see using this instrument now, now that we have it? Um, you know, so I mentioned this earlier, but, you know, I, I'm looking forward to performance opportunities. Um, I think, you know, it, it just is, provides so much information about, about the music of that time. Um, and so stay tuned. <laughs> Um, okay, Stuart Carter asks, if Clem arrived in North America in the 1730s, this was prior to the founding of either Nazareth or Bethlehem, why did he arrive here ahead of the founders of those communities? Where was he and what was he doing before Bethlehem and Nazareth were founded? Great question, Stuart. Yeah, he was, um, although he was uh, part one of the Moravians, he was, he was at Herrenhut. Um, he knew Zinzendorf and so forth, but actually uh, they were on the outs. And, uh, and uh, so Clem had essentially left the Moravians and he arrived in America actually with the Schwenkfelders uh, when they came in 1733. And it was only really uh, much later in life that he came back into the Moravian uh, community And um, Scott Gordon asks, uh, he's, he's, he's forgetting to when roughly you are dating the upright piano and how did you arrive at this rough date? Yeah. Um, right. Well, there's the, uh, there's the traditional story um, 
and we haven't we haven't found what it's really based on that it was uh, it made its debut at uh, the Whitfield House in 1745 is it 45 I think um, but uh, we don't know that that was the instrument that was referred to in in whatever the reference was very likely the term used was probably clavier which would refer just as well to a harpsichord or, or a clavichord um, but what we're basing it partly on is, uh, and this is this was something that that only emerged in the uh, the technical analysis of the instrument itself, is that the the um, some things about the layout of the strings. Um, it's something called scaling. Um, you know, the one string and is is twice the length of the note an octave higher, or usually. But there are many other sort of variations on that uh, rule of thumb. And this instrument has a scaling, uh, a, a scheme for laying out the, the strings, which really um, was very anachronistic for even the mid 18th century. Um, uh, it, it appears to be based on a scheme that was um, developed in organs in the 17th century and was uh, falling out of favor by the middle of the 18th century. And that was another clue uh, and another sort of related clue that Clem was operating from uh, basics, basic layout concepts that he had learned in his youth. Uh, so that by the time, by the mid 18th century, they were quite old. So it seems unlikely the instrument, from my view, was made after Clem. And Clem died in 1762, I think. Um, and presumably he didn't build it in the last year of his life. Uh, so it looks like it could, I, I estimate the date of the instrument is somewhere around 1750 to 60. Yeah, and you, you mentioned the records. We are sort of trying to take a look back into those records. Of course, it's, it's not an easy task. Um, mm -hmm. So another question here from Peter um, Babington: What hammer what hammer covering does it have? Uh, <laughs> this is actually a really interesting question. Um, each hammer head was divided into into two. Half of it was a, a piece of brass was inserted, so that it was brass that struck the string. Um, the other half of the hammer was covered in um, I'm in leather. Uh, I would say a pretty thin piece of leather. Um, John, you could tell us exactly what sort of leather you used for that. Um, but there is a, a mechanism, the hammers are guided through a rack and that rack can be shifted to the left or to the right by a hand stop uh, in order to engage either the brass or the leather to strike the string. So you had control over the tone or the, of the affect of the string um, simply by pulling a hand stop to get either the brass or the leather to strike the string. That was a very important part of uh, the instrument as it representing uh, the phenomenon in Dresden, where Clem was from, in the early 18th century of a phenomenal popularity of, uh, has any mention been made of uh, Hebenstreit and yeah. the pendulum, okay. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, Hebenstreit was a, uh, he played a, a, a sort of large version of the hammered dulcimer. And he was a virtuoso. Um, he was extremely popular throughout Europe, but he was based in Dresden. And uh, it was such a phenomenon that, and it was a difficult instrument to play. So there were a number of, uh, instrument makers who attempted to add a keyboard to the basic concept of this hammered dulcimer. And that way, you know, anyone with keyboard skills could play uh, like Hebenstreit. And, uh, and so that's what we think the tradition was that, that Clem or whoever made this instrument was following. And uh, recent studies of piano history have made quite a lot of the the fact that um, that Hebenstreit uh, and the hammer dulcimer, which was capable of different kinds of sounds depending on whether you used 
hard hammers or soft hammers uh, could be imitated by a keyboard instrument. So the fact that the hammers have these two halves, by shifting the hammers a little bit, you could either strike the string with a brass piece or shift it the other way and it hits with, uh, with, with uh, leather, gives you two radically different sounds. It makes the instrument almost like two different instruments. And that's a pretty important uh, aspect of those earliest uh, uh, Dresden-based piano uh, makers, piano design concepts. So the next two questions are for, for Gwen. Um, so Gwen, I'm, I'm going to invite you to, to unmute your, your microphone and, and join us to answer these next questions. Uh, Riddick asks if Gwen has anything to say from having played this instrument. And Karen Jacob asks, uh, asks you, Gwen, if you could give a little information about the Moravian composers of that time that she found, that, or that you found. Um, so. Am I on? <laughs> there you are. OK. Um, yeah, well, first of all, about the instrument, it, oh, it, was, a, it was wonderful to play. It was just truly, it, what, a, what a treat. It was marvelous. And uh, yeah, the question about repertoire, I mean, I think most of you know that uh, piano in Moravian circles, piano would have been used to play chorales, uh, which would be normal and popular music, popular keyboard music of the day. So um, actually when I went to record, I played two different chorales, uh, one that you heard and one using the, um, uh, the kind of what I would Deem the lute stop, <laughs> so and uh, so a quieter, quieter stop, and um, and then um, for the other repertoire, I went to one of the oldest Bethlehem manuscript books that we have, and uh, transcribed a couple of works from that. One was by a Moravian composer Bechtel, which was at, which actually a little later. But the other was from Naumann, uh, who was not Moravian, but he was a German composer who was known and loved in Moravian circles. We have a lot of Naumann works in our collection. And um, so that's, that's the type of material that would have been played. Uh, and it was, oh, it, it was fun. It was just fun to play it on this instrument. Um, so a related, somewhat related question, uh, Karen Jacob, asks what at what pitch did you tune the instrument um and was there any idea about that how did you analyze i want to I, I think it's the wire how did you analyze the wire oh john you're muted okay um actually uh the the scaling of the instrument makes it um uh, capable perfectly capable of playing up to about A430, uh, which is, uh, is the pitch of the Tannenberg organ that stands a few feet away from the reproduction. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what else to say about that, but, but it's capable of going up to 430 very easily. The scale is, um, for, for anyone, uh, harpsichord uh, people, forte piano people, the scale is not Pythagorean, so it's the uh, the length of each string is more is 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 less than double the string an octave higher. So it's um, uh, and which partly accounts for the rather uh, odd shape of the case. Uh, it's not very long and slender with a with a deep uh, bent side that goes up high, but it's. Um, it's it's got this uh, kind of very short attenuated uh, kind of uh, profile. Okay, and then um, uh, from I think it's Manu. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. Congratulations! Will any of the research get published or otherwise made available? Of course, John, you just did the presentation for the for the Bethlehem conference. Um, but I think there's possibly a publication in the works. Is that is that what I hear? Uh, well, first of all, should should mention that there is an ex, a fairly extensive unpublished report that is in the files at the Moravian Historical Society. Uh, so anyone, uh, I presume, could uh, could get access to that if if they want to uh, for research. Um, 
Yeah, I've given some thought to uh, publishing uh, in the American Musical Instrument Society journal. Um, I think there's more debate to be done about um, our hypothesis about who made the instrument. Um, and, um, and uh, but there's a possibility of publication. No firm plans yet. And then Linda Zimmerman asks, what was what was the music which we heard played done with brass or the leather hammers? Um, I believe that um, the piece that was played from the stage at Williamsburg was with the brass. Yes. Um, and possibly the piece at the end when the credits started rolling was done with the leather, but I, I'd have to go back and listen to that again. I should have made that more clear in the video. Yeah, my audio was not quite clear enough, so I, I wasn't always uh, sure, and, and I ducked out for a while. It does have two very distinctive sounds, so when you hear them played um, together or, you know, in uh, su succession, it, it's, it's clear, it's obvious, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, oh, oh Gwen says the chorale was played using the brass hammers. Um, did you use tools from the time to make the reproduction? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> some, some tools, sure, but not all tools. I was perfectly willing to use uh, power tools, and I think Tom too. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, based on, Bridget Weber asks, based on what John said about using things, about things be, being up for debate, so what is the leading argument against attributing it to Clem? I would say that fa the fact that we haven't found the, the, the actual diary entries, right? Um, I mean, that would, that would certainly help shed some light if we had some sort of um, actual written documentation about, about um, his time and his time with, with, uh, Dave, with, with Tannenberg. Um, but John and, and Tom, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Lori Libin has, uh has commented that it seems unlikely that an instrument like that, uh, if, it, uh, if it appeared in the Moravian community from the beginning, that it didn't show up elsewhere in uh, the records in some way. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's always a possibility of getting some very solid evidence that way. So actually, uh, Lori has commented, and maybe Lori, why don't you, um, if you if you would like, to go ahead and unmute yourself, and and maybe you can speak to that last question. Let, let me suggest that uh, Lori. Oh, just lost John. No, yeah, you you yeah. There okay. you go. Uh, yeah, let me let me uh, also as you hand over to uh, to Lori, uh, I want to I want to give Lori some credit. He's been kind of a, a very great friend of this, this project. And in a, in a sort of uh, fu funny way, he's been kind of a frenemy. Uh, he's played the role of, uh, of um, uh, devil's advocate, which I appreciate very much uh, because uh, every time I make some claim about uh, this instrument having been probably made by John Clem, uh, he throws up all kinds of, uh, of possible, possible objections I may be overlooking. And uh, so I think he could probably um, express more clearly than I what the arguments are against uh, uh, Clem as a maker. Well, um, can you hear me, first of all, because I can't see? Yes, yes? yes okay. we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Um, I really appreciate all of the really deep thought that has gone into this project on everybody's part, least of all my own, because really this, you know, I, I was looking at this instrument in the 1990s and an awful lot has been learned since then. Um, I don't know whether it was made by Clem or not. There's very little to compare it to. I doubt very much that Clem would have seen an instrument like this before he came to Philadelphia in 1733. But it's certainly possible that an instrument like this was imported at some later time or that a drawing of such an instrument was imported and that Clem might have seen it. But it's also possible 
that someone else could have had access to an instrument or a drawing and made such an instrument. Um, it wouldn't surprise me, assuming that it really is American wood, that it might have been made in Philadelphia by Clem when he lived there, or by Firing or one of the other builders who were active at that time and brought at a later time to, to Nazareth. Um, I wonder why the upright form was chosen. It seems to me that it would be more difficult to make an upright form of hammer dulcimer or pantalon, whatever you want to call it, than it would be to make the normal horizontal form that you see in a harpsichord. So if a more difficult upright form were chosen, it would have to be, it seems to me, to save space. And the cutoff top of the instrument looks truncated, which looks like it also was made to fit under a low ceiling, like a ship's cabin. And I wonder why someone would have chosen to make a more difficult form if there weren't some reason. And I don't think that such a reason exists in the Whitfield house. I don't think that, it, that there was a low ceiling or that there was a necessity to save space to the extent that uh, one would choose this particular form. It, it's just a question in my mind. Um, I don't know. I think there's an awful lot still to be learned. I would love to look more closely at the instrument, at the original, but regardless of of all these questions about origin and provenance, the process of replicating this instrument and the outcome of it is so exciting and so important for American music history that to me, it doesn't really matter so much who made it or in what year. It seems clear that it's an 18th century instrument in a Moravian context suited to the music that Moravians would have played and it just opens the door to hearing that music in a new and exciting and revelatory way. And for me, that's the most important outcome of the whole project. Very well said, Laurie, thank you. Um, and Scott Gordon has a comment. To, to be further skeptical, we don't know, do we, how long this instrument has been in the Whitfield House. Perhaps it only entered the MHS collection in, the, in 1850, in which case, the connection to Clem and the dating are more questionable. Um, and he also asks if more of the provenance is known. And so all good questions. Um, yeah. Well, I think those are all of the questions in the chat for now. Um, and so I just wanna thank you all for joining us this afternoon um, as we celebrate this, this, um, this amazing project. Um, again, thank you to Tom and Michelle and John um, for all of your work. Um, and, and of course, to Lori for bringing this project to our attention. Um, I can't wait to welcome you all to the Whitfield House at some point in person so that you can hear the instrument and get a, get a real demonstration of it. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, thank you. everyone. Thank you.